Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Jasper T. Scott. His box set, Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents. Also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space. Once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate, which is the only way in or out of dark space. But not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady, Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them, but now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light, and that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor... The Valor series book one will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. 
That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Deborah Crombie on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book. It's called A Bitter Feast and is the 18th book in the Duncan Kincaid and Gemma James novel series. Uh, Deborah, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. Uh, I love the new book. Welcome to the show. Hi, Hank. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, Deborah. we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh. Um... I don't know, making making up stories when I was a, a little kid about strange little gnome-like men that lived in a cave in the creek bank by where we lived, I, which sounds kind of bizarre, but I told, I told myself stories about them. And um, so maybe that was the, the very first sort of little, little creative nudge. Um, I didn't actually start writing until I was in my teens, and I wrote poetry. I love that. I, I love that the first thing that you came up with was a fantasy story about, uh, you know, otherworldly creatures. And there, there's something that, that goes across all genres. Uh, that there's something that 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 just draws us to those kinds of stories for whatever reason. I think it's interesting that I still remember it so vividly. You know, and I couldn't yeah. have been more than four or five, maybe. <laughs> I love that. Um, were you a bookish kid? Oh, yeah, yeah. My, uh, We lived out in the country. I mean, the, the country, the city overtook years ago what was country when I was a kid. But uh, when I was, you know, before elementary school, we, had, we were on 20 acres, and my – uh, only sibling, my older brother was almost 10 years older than I was. So I was a very solitary kid. And uh, my grandmother lived with us. She had been a school teacher. She was a retired school teacher. And we read all the time. I think I must have been reading by the time I was four. Uh, and my parents tried to send me to private kindergarten when I was five, and I refused to go. <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted to stay home and read with my grandmother. <laughs> oh, I love that. So you were not precocious at all. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um. So so it doesn't mean I was a good student. But uh, well, you know, I, I was the same way. I was not a good student at, at all. But uh, if things interested me, I was all in. Uh, but you know, if, if I was not interested in what you were teaching, uh, you might as well give up. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was always in trouble in elementary school and, you know, even in middle school and high school for daydreaming, but especially in elementary school. Um, but you know, there must've been some sort of creative process going on there. Right. You know, that, that's a story as old as time. The, creative kids get in trouble for daydreaming that they later turn uh you know into a career path and if if people could could learn to to help them harness that early on we might save everyone from some heartache along the way yeah wouldn't that be great that would I mean, be school great was, school was hard, was school was hard for me um and i was certainly not anybody that people would have picked out as you know, ending up having a successful career as a writer, much less, you know, anything else. And my brother was, uh, my brother was one of those top notch students and, you know, best grades and everything and math prodigy. And um, that made it really hard. Uh, my older sister was the same way. Don't you just hate those people? <laughs> <laughs> No, we yeah, don't hate them, but that, you know, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's every younger sibling has to deal with that. Um, yeah, where, but it was hard. It was hard growing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did you call home? Because uh, as someone who writes English mystery stories, uh, your your accent betrays you. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> your listeners will be able to guess that I am not English. Um, 
No, I, I grew up uh, in a suburb north of Dallas, and I still live north of Dallas, but about 20 miles further north than I did when I was growing up. So, yeah, I'm about as, I'm about as uh, Texan as you can get. Gotcha. Uh, the, the new book, A Bitter Feast, which is your 18th. Congratulations on 18 books in this series. Thank you. Uh, I absolutely love it. I love a good English mystery, um, English and Scottish mysteries. I just love them. Uh, there's something uh, – well, you know, for, for an American kid uh, growing up, that there's something – otherworldly and exotic about reading, you know, about other countries and immersing yourself in another culture. Uh, what was it for you that was the initial draw that, uh, that took you to this magical land of England? You know, and, and I jokingly, only half jokingly say that, you know, maybe it started with Winnie the Pooh. I actually have my original, you know, 1950s uh, editions, A.A. Milne editions, but I don't know. There was just something about the language and the landscape and everything that just fascinated me. And then, you know, from the time I was in grade school or elementary school and up into middle school, I read, you know, I just anything I could get my hands on that was British. Uh, I had a big thing for Arthurian legend and myth and, you know, and I read C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and, uh, and then, you know, as I got a little bit older, junior high, high school, I really got into English crime novels and um, there, I don't know, you know, I said past life, maybe, who knows? I had my I had my DNA tested last year because nobody in my family was very interested in um, you know where either side of the family came from, and you know there are no family stories about being descended from pilgrims or you know anything like that. And um, I I found uh, that my DNA profile was like eighty percent English Scottish. So it's interesting, you know. Who knows? Who knows? I didn't. I didn't know. Yeah. Well, uh, growing up in the uh, American Deep South, uh, like I did, there's uh, a lot of stories of you know descendants from England and all that, and, and we had our DNA done as well, and we're like ninety five percent all from the British Isles, and uh, I, I just yeah. often wonder if there's something that calls back. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe that's just a, a romanticized way of saying that we like these kinds of books and we're looking for a reason to. Um, but, but to explain uh, why we like them. So yeah, much. <laughs> yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Uh, what was your What was your first experience of going to uh, to England? Oh, uh, when I graduated from college, when I eventually graduated from college, <laughs> because it said I had a very checkered educational career. Um, and, you, and you graduated with I, a with a biology degree, right? I did, which I is did. exactly what a writer should get. Um, I, I am well-rounded, uh, but I, you know, I think my liberal arts education went and the, and the scientific background went a long way towards, you know, helping with the, the objective part of writing. Um, but when I, when I graduated from, from college, which was a school called Austin college here in North Texas, my parents took me to Europe on one of those, you know, if this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium sort of trips. But we spent the first five days in England, a little bit in London, which I don't remember very much. But then uh, we rented a car in Oxford and we drove all over um, the Cotswolds and Bath and uh, Glastonbury and Stonehenge and Back to, and we, you know, different places in the Cotswolds and then, you know, back to Oxford. And I, but I thought that first trip when we landed at Heathrow, and it's so funny because I told, because I, for years I flew in and out of Gatwick. And so I told this story for years about having landed at Gatwick. And then <laughs> about a year ago, I dug out an old passport and looked through the stamps and it was Heathrow. <laughs> so, um, but I just, you know, I looked out at that English landscape and I just had the most intense feeling of homecoming 
you know, I've never experienced anything else like that, but I still feel that way every time I go to the UK. Oh, I love it. Um, and you lived there for a while, didn't you? Eventually? I did. Well, I, I came back from that trip and I was determined to do whatever it took to go back to England. And I did. I, you know, I moved back home and I worked in a family business and saved money. And about nine months later, I went back for a couple of months on my own and just traveled all over England and Scotland. And then, you know, eventually my money ran out and I had to come home and, you know, figure out something else to do. And I had finished uh, a publishing course that was taught by Rice University. And I met in Dallas of all the bizarre things, my Scottish ex-husband uh, who was in Dallas for uh, like a six-week training program at Texas Instruments. And then, you know, so we had this kind of whirlwind romance and he went back to Edinburgh and, you know, we did letters in those days and very expensive long-distance phone calls. And you know, he said, well, why don't you come over and we'll get married? <laughs> <laughs> I've known him six weeks. Uh, oh, wow. So, so yeah. I said, Scotland? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, the phone bill got cheaper, no, I'm sure. I did. I did. It was, it was a crazy thing. I don't regret it, but it, it was a crazy thing to do. And we lived in Edinburgh, and then he got transferred to uh, Chester, and we lived in Chester. And, you know, we eventually came back to the States because it was just – he he wanted – to live in the States. And it was just, you know, this was the eighties and it was just, it was very tough economically in Britain, but I never stopped being homesick for the UK. Wow. Do, do you remember what the first idea for that first book that you wrote was? Uh, and, and do you, were there any specific circumstances around it that you remember that, uh, that brought that story alive to you? Oh, absolutely. Just crystal clear. Uh, when I was still, I was married to my, my Scottish ex, and we were on holiday, as the Brits say, because you don't say vacation, you say holiday, uh, in Yorkshire, where we had been before. We'd been with my parents, um, but this time we were on our own, and we were staying in a little town, market town in North Yorkshire called Thirsk, which is where for anybody who still remembers James Harriet, by the way, I heard that they were going to make a new uh, adaptation of James Harriet books. So, so that maybe that will introduce a new generation to James Harriet stories. But uh, so we were staying in Thirsk and we were driving one day up in the North Yorkshire moors and we passed this Georgian style house on the side of the road with a big fancy, you know, gold plaque, brass plaque on the gatepost. And it was a timeshare. And I said, that looks really interesting. Can we, can we go look at that? And so we did. And we, we toured the place and we got brochures and I just, you know, I thought of timeshares as like, you know, this, this Spanish Costa del Sol or something, not a Georgian house in Yorkshire. And I just, I got this idea and I thought, wouldn't this be a fun place to set sort of an updated English country house mystery? And then I started thinking, well, I would need a detective, but I would want my detective to be a London-based detective. So, you know, how would, how would I put my detective here? And then I thought, and my detective needs a partner and, you know, and it all just kind of grew from that. Do you remember how long it took you to write that first book? You know, I don't exactly. A uh, year and a half, two years maybe. You know, I, 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 had, I came up with basic ideas and then I took every, you know, how to write a novel, how to write a mystery uh, course that I could find to take and read books and and then uh you know I joined Sisters in Crime and MWA and went to conferences and all that kind of stuff and so you know it, that first book is kind of a halting halting process yeah what was more important to you in in learning the craft of writing was it 
the uh, the the how to write uh, books and workshops that you uh, th- that you read and attended, or was it reading other novels and deconstructing them? Oh, I think it was reading and deconstructing, and I did literally deconstruct. I took books that I loved, like. Uh, P.D. James and Dorothy Sayers, and I literally took a pencil and a legal pad and, you know, outlined them. This is what, this is what, this is how you write dialogue. This is how you open a chapter. This is how you set a hook. This is how you close a chapter. You know, this is how you put in red herrings. You know, this is how you structure a novel. And I think, again, as I said earlier, I think some of this goes back to my you know, my, my very good college liberal arts education and in, in learning how to think about things in a, a logical way. But yeah, you know, the, the, the mystery writing seminars and all that kind of stuff, it was all helpful. But I think if I had to choose between the two, it would be the deconstructing. There, there's something magical that happens when you become uh, sort of a story scientist and, and you start taking someone else's book and deconstructing it like you did literally finding out what each piece is, where they are, what they do. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, it, it it almost becomes attainable when you can see it on paper and you can say, I know exactly how they did this. Now, I can you know, use these same steps and, and, you know, make it my own, but uh, it it really does demystify the process a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And I tend, you know, still to do that when I'm reading. And of course I do it with my own books. You know, this is what needs to happen with the plot. And, but one of the funny things about that, that early learning to write process is that I remembered I was terrified of writing dialogue and now, you know, when I when I get to a passage, when I'm writing a book where there's lots of dialogue, it's just like, oh, this is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's so and funny because the pages go so fast. Well, that's so funny because your dialogue is so snappy and so realistic. I love, I absolutely love writing dialogue. I think I started out with the idea that I would be better at, you know, the dis- descriptive passages. And of course, you know, I always was because I'm I'm American and I'm writing in British voice. I've had one American character, I think, in all of my novels, and a, a minor character. And um, but it's you know it's very strange. I just it's just a different place in my head and what the voice that I hear in my head when I'm writing is British voice. I mean, you know, as voice is a general thing, not, and it's just different. I mean, it's not just the word usage, it's a difference in the, in the, in the patterns of language and the construction of sentences, um, and in the dialogue. Sure. Well, was there anything in particular that helped you to get over your fear of dialogue? Oh, I don't know, just. Just, just practice, doing it. <laughs> I think, and, and there's this, yeah, and there's this just magic thing that happens. I mean, I, I, I learned in that very first book and, and many, many times since that, you know, and if you write, because I'm an outliner and, you know, when you, when you write in a logical way and you say, okay, well, you know, Duncan needs to go here and talk to these people and find out something. Because you know you need that to move the plot along. And then, or, you know, or Gemma needs to do this and find out something, talk to somebody, whatever. And then you put the characters on the page and they start talking. And it just sounds weird, but but it's like the characters, and I don't, writers, I think writers always sound a little bit woo-woo when they say this, but, you know, the characters really do take on a life of their own, and they can they can kind of, you know, I didn't know they were going to say that. I didn't know. And it's not that the characters drive the eventual outcome of the story, but they do come to life on the page, and it's just the most fun thing. I think it is probably the most fun thing about writing. 
Well, this is the only podcast where it's perfectly acceptable to talk about the voices, uh, you know, talking and, and you're just listening and reporting on what they say. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Deborah, this is this is book eighteen for Duncan yeah. and Gemma. Uh, how have these characters evolved and grown for you over these eighteen books? Oh my gosh, uh, it's been so interesting. You know, they start uh, they start in the very first book as as colleagues, as partners, and they don't know each other very well, and you know they become friends and. Uh, you know, mutually supportive and, you know, they end up becoming romantically involved, which was a very fraught thing. You know, it was uh, in their professional situation. It was, it was certainly not the ideal thing to happen. And, um, and, and it was certainly not something that I planned from the beginning from that first book. I think I could see it by, you know, the second, definitely in the third, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't know how their storyline was going to evolve. So it's been very, very interesting uh, to follow these characters and how their relationship is developed. And, you know, they're now a blended family and with kids and complicated lives and, um, you know, they feel very real to me. Um, what has been the most fun trouble that you've put them in over these 18 books? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe... Uh, Maybe Gemma finally having to to make the decision to commit herself to the relationship. The, the um, personal investment. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, as far as yeah, as far as the development of the series. Um. I mean, I've gotten them into all kinds of fun plot trouble in the different books. Right. As a, as someone who does not have uh, a background in police work and uh, criminal justice, uh, it, it's hard enough to write a you know a mystery series or a police procedural uh, that, that your books kind of dip into. Um, but then you add you add the added stress of writing about a different country and you know the differences there in in how the justice system works and how uh you know police procedures work and and all of that do you have any advice for someone who wants to tackle this kind of writing and what have you learned about uh writing about another country well i mean obviously you do a lot of uh research um you know, I read, I read by choice. You know, when I'm, I'm, when I'm not reading for obligation, uh, I read mostly British crime fiction because I always want to, you know, keep my oar in. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, British television and um, that. You know, but the research is a whole lot easier now than it used to be. The um, the book, a couple of books before uh, Better Feast, to Dwell in Darkness, and uh, particularly Garden of Lamentations, um, have to do with a sort of skullduggery in the Metropolitan Police and the under uh, undercover operations that were run by the by Special Branch and the Metropolitan Police and you know, there was just so much stuff available that wouldn't have been available even probably 10 years ago uh, because of the Internet. So um, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. You know, do you... I, I do, I do, I go every year and I do lots of just, you know, on the ground research and 
and uh, photos and talking to people and maps and history and when you're when you're thinking about a new book for this series, uh, what usually comes first for you? Is it is it an idea for Duncan and Gemma? Uh, uh, is it did they come first? Does a, a plot device come first? Uh, is it maybe a, a news story that you've read lately that gives an idea for some trouble to stir up? Uh, what what's usually the, the that early kernel of story that comes to you? It's usually a combination of things. I mean, it varies a little bit from book to book, but uh, it's kind of, you know, spaghetti on the wall. Uh, (laughs) If we can talk about a bitter feast a little bit. Yeah. I had wanted, you know, the last several, three books had been set in London. And I kind of was feeling a little bit constricted. You know, it would be fun to get them out of London. And because of things that happen uh, in Garden of Lamentations, the previous book, all my major characters were kind of at odds with each other. Right. Um, and nobody was really working together. And I, so I was thinking, you know, it would be really fun to just put everybody in the same place and on the same page and working on the same case. And, um, and I would like to get out of London. And then I thought, I had always wanted to set a book in the Cotswolds and uh, wouldn't it be fun? And I hadn't been to the Cotswolds when I started the research for a bitter feast. I hadn't been to the Cotswolds since that first one. Well, I mean, I'd been to Oxford and Bath and, but, um, uh, and, you know, Glastonbury, Somerset, but I hadn't been to the little villages in the Cotswolds since that first trip with my parents in the seventies. Oh, wow. So Lots I changed. thought, you know, I, yeah, I thought I just want to go back there and, you know, kind of get an idea of what it's like. And I ended up making three trips. Um, and but at the same time that I was thinking these things and I was also thinking about, you know, relational things between my four major characters now, um, I had wanted for quite some time to write a book that centered around a female chef. Uh, I've been, you know, I'm always fascinated by people who do things that require such obsessive, you know, like I've written about rowers, which you can't get much more obsessive than, than <laughs> rowers. Um, but, you know, professional cooking is brutal and it's really, really tough for women to get, I mean, it's not as hard as it used to be, but it's still harder for women in the kitchen, uh, in a professional kitchen than it is for men. And it takes just absolute, you know, commitment and obsession that this is something that you have to do. And, you know, as, as story drivers, that always hooks me, you know, what makes these people tick? And, um, so I wanted to write about, a female chef. And so I started reading, you know, lots of biographies and memoirs and, and uh, books about cooking and chefs. And, and so, you know, the characters that, that this book is based around sort of came to life. Um, so yeah, it's usually this kind of piecemeal thing that all comes together and you hope it's going to make a book. Sometimes it's too <laughs> scary. <laughs> You know, you get halfway through and you think, why did I ever think this was a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, but usually the, it comes out all right in the end, you know, right, not wood. Right. Well, when you're, when you're researching uh, on the ground, uh, so to speak, uh, do you find yourself just kind of soaking up the atmosphere? Uh, like, what is it that... Um, I call it sponging. <laughs> sponging, sponging. I love that. Um, you know, it, it's so weird when you're writing. The little details that you pick up along the way that you add to your writing, that just make it feel real. Um, when you're doing the the research on the ground, do you notice those things? Like, are are you making notes? Okay, this is this street feels like this, uh, or is it just part of the sponging? And it just comes back out when you squeeze the sponge on the page. It's a a combination. I mean, I do take a lot of notes and, 
you know, I, I carry I, I carry a notebook with me everywhere. I don't do everything on my phone. Uh, but one of the things about smartphones, you know, that has changed uh, the ability to do that kind of research is just is being able to take pictures. Take a picture, constantly. yes. You know, and I and I and then take, add little I notes about it. Yeah, and I take just hundreds of pictures that are not anything that anybody else will ever see. You know, I'm not taking them because of their um, photographic quality, or but but they they are research notes. You know, these are the shops that are on the street, and this is what it looked like at this time of day, and you know, things that so, can trigger um, a memory. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's extremely helpful to be able to go back and and look at those and trigger you know, what it felt like, what it sounded like. I'm a big proponent of, you know, the five senses on, on every page. Yeah. Um, well, that's what makes your book so atmospheric that you feel like you're there. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a very detail. I'm a very detail oriented person anyway that, you know, I want to know what things look like, tasted like, sounded like, and, uh, one of the things that some of the advanced readers have said about a bitter feast is that they were hungry the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that means you nailed it. Yeah, I thought that was great. That is fantastic. Um, Deborah, if someone is just coming to your writing, uh, can they pick up a bitter feast and, and jump in there? Or do they, do they need to go back and get some history on Duncan and Gemma? Oh, I think they can jump in. Um, yeah, I, I think it works well as know, a standalone. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, what you thought. Um, it, it, that's always such a tricky thing with a, a long-running series like this, is that you know you want every book to be able to stand on its own because you can't realistically expect readers to say, oh, that sounds good, but I'll go back and start 18 books ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I always figure they can jump in. And if, if I mean, there will be long-term spoilers because, you know, you know where the characters are going to end up in the latest book. But I think if people enjoy them and they like the characters and they want to know more about them, that then and I have a lot of readers that start with whatever the newest book is and then you know they go back to the beginning and read through the series so I don't I don't see that I don't I hope that's not a, an issue yeah well the new book is called A Bitter Feast it's the Duncan Kincaid and Gemma James uh, novel 18 uh, guys you're going to love this book if you're up for a great uh, mystery with uh, with some thriller elements in a in a cozy setting. This is a fantastic book, uh, Deborah. If people are just learning about you and want to find out more and connect with you, is there a place that they can find you online? Oh, they definitely can. My website is uh, www.debracrombie.com, and I'm Deborah Crombie. Uh, author on Facebook and Deborah Dot Crombie on Instagram and uh, Deborah Crombie on Twitter. So great! We're going to send everyone to see you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, Deborah. Oh, thank you for having me. It was such fun. Now, stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane series. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, 
carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire. It began to hiss and pop. The snow melted, and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. When she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door, she said. I obeyed. She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again. I deserved to be burned. She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, Grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lap board. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt.